why don't I go ahead and get started? Um, I'll just uh, give a brief presentation about what we hope to do, and then we'll have a little question and answer at the end. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. I'm Danielle McKnight, uh, town planner. Um, and I, I see uh, many of you received a letter, although it sounds like a couple of you didn't get it. So I'm sorry about that. I, I'm not quite sure why. Um, but um, I'm just here to talk tonight um, about the CPC's request um, to, uh, for, to, to to town meeting to um, convey some properties that are within our affordable housing overlay district. Um, I just I'll mention if we have any issues with the audio or you can't hear me, um, just just let me know if I have any trouble with the technology. I'm going to temporarily uh, make um, Chris Hayden uh, the host and then I'll log back out and log back in. Um, so the purpose of our meeting tonight uh, is to explain three warrant articles the Community Planning Commission has submitted um, relating to four properties that are within the affordable housing overlay district. The CPC's goal is for these properties to be conveyed to a developer for small affordable housing projects to be built. The projects are zoned to allow this, um, but the town um, currently owns the properties still. I'll explain the proposal and then the process we hope to use to convey these properties. Um, and then we'd like your feedback and would welcome you know, any questions. Um, and if there's anything that you'd like to cover in more detail that doesn't get covered tonight, please feel free to um, email or give me a call um, in the planning department. Um, so I'm going to start uh, screen sharing my presentation. Okay, is everyone able to see yes. the slideshow? Okay, great. I am not able to view all of you. Oh, here we are. Okay, good. So I should be able to see. Um, if you have a hand up, but I don't stop, feel free to interrupt me because I'm not able to view everyone at once while the slideshow is going. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is an overview of where all the properties are in the affordable housing overlay district. Um, the bold red outlines show the properties. Um, they're not all that easy to see. So I'm gonna give you a close up of the property of the properties that we're actually talking about. Um, have a couple people to let in. There we go. Okay. Um, there are 23 of these properties in total. Um, only four of them are being considered right now uh, for development. Um, the four are 7 St. Teresa Street, 44 and 46 Oakdale Road, and 57 Haverhill Street. I'll show them closer up in just a moment. Uh, the first one, um, here's a closer look of uh, the location of 7 St. Teresa Street. The property is located behind the multifamily building at 258 Main Street. Uh, several single family homes are across the street and the undeveloped parcels next to it and down and across the street, oh, excuse me, um, are owned by the Conservation Commission and they are not proposed for development. Uh, 44 and 46 Oakdale Road. Um, a few more people to admit. <laughs> okay, there we are. Um, 44 and 46 Oakdale Road together make half an acre. Um, the road was extended and improved with paving and a water main and a hydrant uh, several years ago. There are some wetlands to the north, and so we would anticipate a filing with the Conservation Commission, um, depending on the placement of a home or homes on this site. Cool. 57 Haverhill Street is a site that belonged to RMLD before the town acquired it in a land swap. Uh, there are a few areas of wetlands around the front and southeast side of the property. So any placement of homes and septic systems would need to take those into account uh, with the Conservation Commission filing anticipated um, depending on the placement of a home or homes. Um, just to kind of give an overview of the affordable housing overlay district and what is allowed on, on these sites, um, these properties um, along with 19 other properties were uh, rezoned in 2008 with the town's affordable housing overlay district. Um, they were zoned for this purpose in 08, um, and there have also been highlighted in the town's housing production plan um, as a good opportunity to develop a few units of affordable housing, um, but they haven't yet been conveyed for this purpose. Um, I'll go on to describe the zoning in a little bit more detail. Um, I write, um, a developer could put a, a single or two family home here. 
um, a special permit would be needed for a larger development, such as a single family attached, a group of single family attached houses or multifamily units um, up, to, up to eight units. Um, there are also some provisions in here for reusing municipal buildings um, under the affordable housing overlay district, but that doesn't apply to any of these uh, properties. They're all vacant. Um, there are also dimensional and density limits that need to be met. Um, so for example, 40% of um, each site would need to be left as open space. Building area is limited to 20% of a site for a single family home um, and 25% of the site for a two family or a multifamily. The maximum height allowed is two and a half stories or 35 feet, uh, which is the same height allowed in the rest of the town's uh, residential zoning districts. The zoning was written for this district to make development blend well with the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and the intent is for small scale development and not for structures to be taller than their surrounding zoning districts, um, although more units are allowed on these sites than, than in the surrounding uh, properties. So this, is, this was written and intended to be small scale. Um, not very large developments, not, you know, large towers or, lar you know, anything um, of a very, of a very intense, large high density kind of development. Um, go next to the affordable housing uh, zoning district uh, for setbacks, uh, single family and two family homes in this district um, need a front setback of 25 feet, a side setback of 20 feet and a rear setback of uh, 25 feet. Multifamily and single family attached homes have a requirement of a 25 foot front setback, a 25 foot side setback, and a rear setback of 40 feet. There's a maximum density of one unit per 5,000 square feet of lot area in addition to these other limits. So while you could say that by lot area only, um, some of these sites could take you know, an eight unit development, you also have to consider that it can't be any higher than two and a half stories and it has to leave 40% of the site as open space. So that is a pretty limiting um, factor for the, for the zoning. Um, <clears throat> in this zoning district also, um, the affordable units built under the bylaw need to meet the requirements to be included on the town's subsidized housing inventory. Um, currently we are 22 units short of our 10% requirement for affordable housing. We're expecting when the official census numbers are released, we're expecting that gap to be much bigger, probably in the neighborhood of 50 units, although we don't have that confirmed yet. We're not looking to these sites to fill the entire gap. We are looking to these sites for potentially a few units, not um, certainly not the full 22 unit um, deficit that we have. Um, there are additional requirements uh, which call for greater levels of affordability um, for, for, this, for these zoning districts. Uh, the bylaw allows for some market rate development to be built along with affordable units in some cases, but the CPC's goal for these properties is for all the units built to be affordable. Um, for one single family home, that one house has to be affordable. Uh, for a development of two, two homes, the zoning would allow um, one of them to be affordable and one for market rate. Um, for a development of um, more than that, uh, at least a third has to be affordable. Um, so, but again, the, the CPC's goal really is to seek for a developer to make um, units that are 100% affordable. Um, and the bylaw also allows for a range of affordability with the affordable units priced to be affordable to a household earning up to 80% of the area median income. Um, there are also other provisions in this bylaw that um, where, where you could have a range of, you know, 65% area median income. Um, a lot of the time we get feedback on the 80% area median income units that they're not really affordable. Um, for example, the Edgewood apartments are 80%. Um, they're still quite expensive, um, you know, by some standards. So we're hoping to find a little bit of a greater level of affordability for these units, um, but, the, but the requirement is 80%. Um, our goals uh, for conveying the property, um, the CPC would like for the town to convey these properties um, for, for no money. It's not something that um, we're hoping that the town would make a profit on um, to an affordable housing developer. Um, we're not recommending market rate development, as I mentioned. Um, the preference would be for 60% area median income um, and for all affordable units. Um, no new zoning changes are proposed for these. Um, we would not be necessarily entertaining, um, you know, a town meeting action to allow for anything different um, than what is what they are zoned for. Um, 
we expect the process to be used um, to be a request for proposals. Um, and the proposals wouldn't be to ask for, you know, to select a highest bidder because we're not really looking for a profit to be made. Um, the proposals would be for a developer to describe the type of project, the number of units, um, and to, to talk about what type of project they could do. And we would be looking for them to propose things that would be, um, you know, a, a, a modest development that would fit well with the neighborhood. Um, we would ask them to describe the development, the level of affordability, um, and then any developer that would be selected will be asked to hold neighborhood meetings to present their project and answer questions. Um, I think even in the RFP development, um, we would want um, to have neighborhood meetings to make sure that we had input from, from the neighborhoods to um, as we shaped what we are asking for, for proposals, um, rather than just put it out and see what comes back. I think we really wanna make sure we understand what the neighborhoods are comfortable with and whether there are preferences for numbers of units or certain type of development. Um, and then um, in terms of public hearings, um, the single family and two family homes could be developed um, you know, without uh, any kind of a site plan review or special permit that would just be like any other uh, single family home subject to a building permit. Um, but anything that is a multifamily development would need a special permit, which would be a public hearing with the planning commission. And then uh, all of these have wetlands somewhere in the vicinity. So um, depending on the placement of a project, um, we for anything within 100 feet of a wetland, the developer would also need to file with the conservation commission, um, which would likely be a, another public hearing. Um, for, for upcoming meetings, um, the select, the next, the next real step for this is, um, the select board is going to be holding their informational hearing on the warrant articles, um, on Monday. That's a virtual meeting, um, that's going to be on September 20th. Um, following that, um, is town meeting where the vote on whether these properties can be conveyed um, will, will be held. Um, that's gonna be at the high school on October 4th. Um, and then if that if that is successful, um, then there will be further uh, neighborhood meetings as we would go through the process of developing, um, developing an RFP. Um, and at, at this point, um, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions here, any feedback, any concerns. Um, and I'm going to temporarily stop sharing my screen so that I can see and hear everyone um, who would like to speak Hold on one moment. Um, let's stop the screen share. And then um, if you have a question or a comment or would like to give us any feedback, um, if you could just uh, just state your name and your address and I'll, I'll be sure to note that down and all the comments yeah, that we get tonight, yeah. I'll be submitting to the select board as well. Okay, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Duchara. Uh, Diane, Diane, Mike DeChar with uh, 34 Heritage Way. Um, just a clarification. Did you say if, if there's any building uh, that it's on wetlands, it has to go to another hearing? Yes. Anything within 100 feet of um, a wetland will need to be filed with the Conservation Commission. Can you, can you and that will be. So there are some wetland areas on each of these okay, properties, so this, but depending this is just on how informational. It I'm sorry. There are there there are there are, there are wetlands. I've been up here at 27, 28 years, and I've gone to several of these. One was one developer uh, wanted to come in and, and build on Haverhill Street, uh, mm -hmm. a large complex. And we went, we had town meeting and we had a planning meeting at that time and it impacted the wetlands, but they said that they could uh, amend that and change the wetland area. And I stated publicly for the residents here on Chestnut and um, Heritage Way, uh, the back of this area is wetlands. Right now it's flooded out there and any water problems. And, and that developer at the time was several, several meetings we had uh, with Drew's proposal. They had since built four single family homes in that area, but there was a multi area complex steps uh, what I'm concerned about and is Mike, the wetland area Mike, and Mike you and may so have to uh, uh, that's that's my main concern Mike, you may have to turn off your videos to get the uh, voice come in oh I I can hear you but I think there was a little bit of a delay so I just want to make sure I caught your comment fully so I know you had some concerns about wetlands in the area and would would um just want to be sure that they were properly reviewed by the conservation commission 
Yeah, that's and correct. Because the uh, previous developer to try to come in here and build a, a large complex on Haverhill Street and uh, uh, withdrew after uh, the neighbors and myself got involved uh, because of the impact on the wetland area in this hey, uh, Haverhill that's uh, heritage wet area. Okay, thank you. That's helpful for me to know. I didn't know about the previous proposal, but I'll find out what information I can about that and also note your, your comment, concern about the wetland areas. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is Lionel Bean. Mm -hmm. 124 Hi, Hi Lionel, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, two things. Now, I hear them on Heritage Way talking about the wetlands, but now I'm on, I'm on Chestnut, so I'm basically at the intersection and my week basically consists of watching car accidents. So now you're gonna throw up a complex that's gonna end up bringing in more cars when the cars that are already here can't even manage the four-way intersection. So what is Definitely. the consideration for that? Because I mean, they already said they couldn't have a light and we literally hear their accident run down our, our address is probably on speed dial at the police department considering we're running down all the time and if you're allowed to put so many more houses that means that's so many more cars and people can't manage it now and now you're going to have cars pulling out onto Havel Street you know I know Heritage is talking about their wetland but on Havel Street we're just literally just watching accidents all the time and now you're going to add cars coming out which is probably just going to make it more. So what are they doing about that? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, go ahead. I agree with you. We, uh, we, we live on the Heritage Way. We go through that uh, stop, stop sign and intersection every day. And uh, that, that, that stop sign has been an accident uh, over the years. Yeah, okay. I, don't even allow, I don't even allow my kids to go that way. I have them go down Central Street. Because the, it's just cars fly, it, there's no consideration. Like I said, it's like, like I said, we'll be at dinner table and all of a sudden you hear a crash and I'm running down there. I'm running down a check and my wife's dialing 911. And I mean, it's and like you said, it's like a once a week occurrence, and then hit the summertime and you got a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. Now you have the kids back in school driving and we know they're not going to be manning it that well either. So, now we're gonna sit here and add more houses and that's just more traffic. Like you said, he's coming from Heritage down. So coming from Heritage, Haverhill, Haverhill, Chestnut, they're all running through that intersection. Okay. And the intersection right, probably helpful. has the most accidents in North Reading. <laughs> I think it is a very high crash location. I, I know our DPW is studying it right now for some improvements, but I don't know what the status is of it. Um, thank you for that. I, I definitely will note. I think the concerns. last status was that they, they can't put a light there because then that will really confuse people when you have a blinking light. Because I was on the board, we were, I was on the committee for the trucks not coming down Haverhill to New Street because the kids stood at the corner of Tres, Ch um, Chestnut and Cedar and you had these 18 wheelers coming down. And that was, a, that was a lost thing because the trucks can't go down Franklin Street because Redding already beat us to the punch. So that's why they come down to North Redding. Okay, thank you for well, that. That's, that is helpful. Um, Danielle, I have a question. Can you hear me? My name is Jeff Borkowski. I'm at 112 Chestnut. Yes, go I ahead, two, Jeff. I have two questions. Is there ever a scenario where the 100 foot setback from the wetlands is changed, where it's reduced? That's question number one. And question number two is if wetlands comprises, you know, X percentage of a property, is the wetlands considered or is the wetlands considered to be part of the open space when it's completed if the wetlands aren't altered or is it the area outside of the wetlands that's that needs to be more than 40 or 40 percent or greater so the zoning doesn't require that the wetlands be eliminated from that equation so the open space can be wetland areas okay. um sometimes you can build within the 100 foot buffer 
that's up to the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. They do sometimes allow that. Um, there is a 12 foot no build okay. that I don't think they really ever allow building at all, but they often do issue permits and orders of condition for development within the 100 foot buffer, but it's dependent on their review um, and how they feel about how the alteration, you know, to the wetland and the impact to the to the resource area. Um, but yes, that does happen um, with permits. And then what's the process? You mentioned the conservation will get involved, I, I, I presume, after the RFP process. Is that right? And then there would be meetings about that? to explain yes. their findings? Yes, um, okay. so the goal would be to put out an RFP and then get specific development plans. And then based on a chosen development plan, um, if those plans were within the resource area, they would have to file with the Conservation Commission. And if the Conservation Commission determines that they require um, you know, a, a, an order of conditions, they would, they would need to have a public hearing for that. Right. And I've got one last question while I have you. Um, how is it determined whether or not it's going to be a single family or a multifamily um, development? Is that when you solicit the RFPs, do you target uh, or, or make suggestions to developers about what that should be? Or is it completely open to the developers to propose what they want to do with the site? I think that's a question that, that we have for all of you tonight, um, the zoning allows for up to eight units where it fits on certain properties. Certainly, you know, 46 and 44 Oakdale couldn't fit eight units because it, it's it's too small. Um, but I think one of the reasons why we wanted to have this, this session was to hear some feedback. Um, if, if we heard that, you know, a few single family homes would be preferable to, you know, an eight unit multifamily development or, um, you know, on a certain property, people really felt strongly that it should be, um, you know, restricted to a certain number of units. I, I think we would like to, he to hear about that. I mean, I think that we're hopeful that the feedback wouldn't be that there should be nothing built. I mean, of course, I understand that most people don't want anything to be built at all. Um, but I think that we're hoping to get a sense of what could be tolerable and comfortable to the neighborhood. Um, you know, I think the goal is to, to work work with the neighbors. Um, knowing that the zoning does allow a little bit more, I think our goal is to get something built and we don't want, um, you know, ambitions for really, you know, developments that are too big and don't fit. We don't want that to, to mean that nothing gets built. So I, I hope I, I hope that's not, um, you know, a sidestepping of the question. I think we're hoping for your feedback about that. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Sure. Thank you. So this is Lionel. This is Lionel Bean again. So how many units will be able to fit on the 57 Haverhill Street pot? Did you say eight? 57 Haverhill Street. So the maximum is eight units for these multifamily developments. 57 Haverhill Street could possibly be, you know, it's big enough that you could probably cut it in half and do twice that. I don't really think that that is um, what the neighborhood would find acceptable. I don't let me speak for you, but I, I have a feeling based on the feedback I've heard that that wouldn't really be an acceptable number of units. And I think that, um, you know, the, the other options are single family homes, two family homes. It, it could be it could be much smaller than that, depending on, um, you know, what, what we hear. Um, and also there are the wetland areas, so you can't build on every square inch of that property. Um, and you need right. to consider that a portion of it has to be left for open space, 40%. You also have to consider it can only be 30 feet, five feet high. These are things that could really limit it. So um, I, I can't tell you for sure the maximum number, but 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 within the constraints of the develop of the zoning that we have, we we know that we're not targeting a very big project here. A few mm -hmm. units probably what form they would take, whether they're single family houses or a small multifamily building. We're, we're not really sure yet because we haven't seen proposals yet. Danielle, does that get baked into the RFP as a covenant of any of any sort? It, it certainly can be. If that's the feedback that we hear from, from the neighborhood, that that's the preference, I think that that is definitely something that, that we would want to consider very seriously and make part of the RFP. Danielle, this is uh, this is Jay uh, and Jane, my wife here uh, at 32 Heritage Way. And uh, type, can you hear me, Danielle? Yes. So type back to uh, what Mr. Dechara, Mike, uh, and Diane said about wetland. And Mike, I know you're not uh, you're the only one you're the one that actually uh, hosts the meeting, but you're not a 
up your enough for building the units. Uh, thanks for hosting that this meeting. And so my my biggest concern about um, building units uh, at Haverhill Street, 57 Haverhill Street, which is behind our heritage way, heritage way, is that we have a we have a big stream running along Mike's house and my my house, and my neighbor uh, on my right. If you face if you're facing the house uh, on the left, my my neighbor Gary and Heidi's house. Their last name is H Hastings. There is a big stream running along the along the back of uh, um, around the in in the wetland area. Mm -hmm. When it, when it, when it rains, it gets really really big big streams. Okay. So, it, it, my biggest concern is that when when the units are built, if if water management is you know is if the builder doesn't manage the water situation and push all the dirt and all the stuff um, backwards. I, I don't know, I'm not the builder. I'm not a, a professional builder or anything. It, it could cause more water and it could push water into our, into our land as well. So that, that's my biggest concern, Danielle. Okay, all right, thank you for that. That's, that's important for us to know. Um, we'll definitely yeah, you, note that. Yeah, as a concern. Yeah, because if you if you walk in if you walk in my backyard and walk into the forest, maybe about 20, 30 feet, you can see that stream. On a okay. normal day, it has water in there. Okay. And then if it rains, it gets really big. Okay. Okay. Now, thank you for that. I think we would want to be sure there was appropriate um, engineering done and you know whatever engineering review was needed to, to be sure that it wasn't having a negative impact on you know the flooding of, of any you know neighboring homes so thank you for that danielle this is jack gilboy at 114 chestnut street and uh thank you again for hosting this conversation tonight i think it's really helpful um i i would like to echo if you're looking for feedback in terms of the impact in the neighborhood specifically the 57 uh, Haverhill Street uh, parcel. I would like to echo the feedback of my neighbor at 124. The issue around traffic and the dangerous issue around the intersection of Chestnut Street and Haverhill. We are relatively new to North Reading. We're just about, we're four years as of yesterday um, at, in the neighborhood. And like our neighbors, we see also frequently see the accidents that happen there. I have actually made multiple um, efforts to reach out to our representative, Bradley Jones, and ask about what kind of provisions can be made there. So all that ladders up to, I would strongly advocate for single family home options there and the, lim the, the limited number, the better. I do think traffic is a significant issue to be of concern. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Yeah, we're, we're 17 years at 124. So we've watched a good amount. Danielle? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't want to cut anyone off. Um I, I think there was someone speaking. Yeah. Daniel. Um yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I I, I apologize. Oh no, that's yeah, okay. I am, you know, on Zoom. I um thank you for hosting the meeting like and I definitely concur with uh, my neighbors. Uh, the traffic is terrible. The traffic is terrible. But what 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 I what I'm concerned about is the size of the proposed lot. Looks like more than one or two, and I would and that just adds to the traffic. Never mind uh, my my own needs and my neighbors' needs in the area is the wetlands. And if you look back on previous records, when I did mention the other development. It, I've said, I went on the record and say, we've never had water or backup in the area since I've lived up here for over 28 years. And it might, it might impact. And uh, like I said, I know RFPs and so forth, but that that is a major concern as well as the traffic and the impact on the area. And uh, like I say, I, I was in public safety. I definitely know. And there has been traffic studies done on that area and speeding and so forth. And like I said, the gentleman proposed the heavy trucking. I remember that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one of my major concerns as well as the impact on the property itself. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Don has his hand up. Yeah, hi, it's Don Sheenak and Crescendo, uh, 57 Oakdale Road. You had mentioned you were looking for feedback 
on the property. When would that be taking place? I'm sorry. When would when would the when would you be taking feedback on the properties? Is if you have a comment now, I'm happy to oh, okay. to note it down no, now. It, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I I think it's great the affordable housing in town. Um, this is a twenty thousand square foot lot at on. Mm -hmm. What do you think could go in there? Maybe a one or two family tops. That's that's what I think. Um, I think if you look at the the zoning, might allow for up to a four unit development, but I don't think we'd be targeting that for this property. I think it's small enough. It has wetlands around it. Um, it may have wedge. I've heard. Um, I, I don't think we're getting more than one or two two family homes. Um, yeah. Okay. On that, I'd have, a, I'd have an issue with four family. I think one or two. Sure. Would be fine. Um, you're okay. right next to wetlands. You've got every other house in the area is. Yeah. Single family. You have one as an in-law and that's it, so. Okay, okay, thank you, that's helpful. Um, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Daniel. Else has a comment? Yes, uh, go ahead, please. In Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. Um, I just have Hi. a couple questions. Um, when this goes in front of town meeting, is this gonna be one article or three? This is three separate articles. Oakdale is together, um, because they would be conveyed together. Okay. But yes, there'll be three separate ones. Okay. And then um, I think you've, so, so with the 44 and 46 hotel, you mentioned it could be up to a two family residence. I mean, so I, I abut that to the rear. That's, okay. a, that's a very small parcel. I'm just kind of wondering the setback. I mean, it would sound like that would be on the street. So I'm not necessarily opposed to putting a home there, but it, mm -hmm. that is a very narrow area. So just living in this area, I don't know, they're gonna be on top of whoever is ultimately across the street there. So just something, when we're looking at that, I'm not sure that you can actually fit anything of any size. You may be right. Um, with the setbacks considered, um, it, it may not be possible to get more than you know one house on that property, which um, I think would be a perfectly acceptable, you know, solution for that property. It is, a, it is a small lot, you're right. Um, okay, and then one thank last, you. One last question on Haverhill, because I'm sure that's gonna be the a main concern of, across the town is, mm -hmm. is there a way to bind it at, this could be very controversial mm -hmm. at town meeting for all the traffic reasons that people are outlining. Sure. Is there a way to bind it in the article or does it have to get convey, approve for conveyance first and then do that? Because I think <sighs> it's a sticking point with a lot of residents. I think I don't um I would have to check it probably with the with the moderator but I think that uh, there could be a motion that could further limit what would be allowed um I don't want to say that for sure because sometimes um, I mean, a motion has to have a you know has to be pretty closely related to but I, I would I would I'll just, I'll just say I, I would be happy to check that with the with the moderator to to find out if that's a possible thing to mo to think, modify with a motion. Otherwise, it could then be modified with putting out an RFP where we would only be looking for a certain number of units. Right. You know, not living near there, but hearing the residents, mm -hmm. and of course, I drive through there all the time. I think if you told the town at town meeting that you're going to limit it to four or six homes across six acres, I think that would go over far better then the traffic, and then you're gonna hear about the schools and the impact of the batch, and you're gonna hear about all of that. So if people get worked up and there could be potentially 24 residences on that property, I think that could pretend, you know, when it goes to town meeting, what, what seems like a good idea could turn into mm -hmm. a lot of backlash if it can't be bound. So I would just be curious and some feedback, if it can be bound, I think that would help at the town meeting, help it pass. Sure, okay, thank you. That that's very helpful. Um, that's something I actually do plan to look into because I sort of, I wondered if, if that question may come up. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Good evening, Danielle. This Hi, how are you? I'm Sanchez, uh, just here gathering information. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other properties that uh, are being considered for this affordable housing project? Right now, we're just looking at conveying these four sites. Um, there are 23 parcels throughout the town um, in the affordable housing overlay district. Um, right now, we don't have them proposed for, for conveyance um, at the upcoming town meeting. I hope in the future that we will be revisiting some of those properties. Um, right now, we're just focused on, on these four. Um, but 
there is also another site that we've been looking at on Carpenter Drive, which is a much larger site and is being, being studied for a much larger development. And we've had um, a neighborhood meeting um, as well with that with the neighborhood. That project is not on the current town meeting um, because we have some issues that we need to work through, I think, um, with that project. But um, for the affordable housing overlay district parcels, um, we're just kind of considering these four for now, but we hope to do more in the future. Um, you know, if, if there is ever interest, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, note that interest and then work with someone to, to plan for future disposition of other properties. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Hi, Danielle, this is Christina Wyatter from 108 Chestnut Street. Can Hi, you explain, good. Can you explain why these four properties were chosen versus the other properties that are in, designated for the district? Sure. Um, so first, I'll start by saying that if we do convey these properties, it will be by an open RFP. So we can't presume to know who the potential developer could be. But we were approached by Habitat for Humanity several months ago. And that sort of started the ball rolling on us looking at this portfolio of properties to see which might be the most appropriate and suitable for development. Um, while all of the properties went through sort of a screening process when they were rezoned to be sure that there could be some kind of development that could could go there. Um, these were properties that were looked at as stronger possibilities because they didn't require, you know, construction of a new roadway. There might be wetlands, but they were a little bit more limited and there was enough upland area that could be suitable for development. Um, these were some of the reasons um, and, uh, you know, Folks from Habitat from Humanity also had um, reached out to, uh, you know, to, to, to see what properties we, we had in this, you know, zoning district and th these were mentioned as some possibilities so these were identified as ones that might be a good fit for them, but that said, um, you know, it, it would be an open RFP and um, while they may well be chosen, you know, it, it, I, I couldn't say that before an RFP went out but th that's the reasoning behind why these properties were, were being focused on right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess well, well, I'll echo the concerns of my neighbors with um, the water that's in my backyard and the the traffic we deal with leaving our houses every day. Okay, and that would be for the Haverhill Street property. Right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Danielle. Tim Sutherland, Seventeen Maple Road. Uh, one more question. The, the titles of these properties, will these always be deed restricted as affordable housing? That is our goal. Um, they, our, our ask is for them to go onto the subsidized housing inventory, which the zoning does require. Um, and if they, if they are developed under that zoning bylaw, um, they, would be, they would be deed restricted in, in perpetuity. And when would we find that at when you said that's our goal. When, what, during what step of the process would that take place? Um, so the, the request that the planning commission has made of town meeting is for the properties to be um, conveyed for, for affordable housing. But if it does pass, the select board does have the right to convey them without a restriction on them. That's not what we're requesting that they do, um, but it, it could happen. I mean, in theory, I guess that, that could happen. So. That's why, I mean, our, our goal would be for, for it to be put out um, that way. And I think what we would be doing is if the if the warrant article, if the question is successful, what we would do is um, then work with the neighborhoods to, um, to finalize terms of an RFP that we felt people were comfortable with. We would ask the select board to um, release that RFP. Um, they still are the gatekeepers as far as it being town owned land. Um, they are the ones who would decide under you know, the terms and conditions that, that, that they would be willing to convey the property. Um, but but our, our, our you know, request certainly is for these to be affordable. And if they are developed as affordable units under this bylaw, then they, they, they do need to be deed restricted. There would have to be you know, a regulatory agreement that gets approved by the State Department of Housing and Community Development, um, and they would go on our, our inventory and they would be on there permanently. I hope that answers your question. I hope it's- yeah, it, um, it, it does. It just goes back to the, I'm, I'm going to try to figure out if there's any way that some of these can, articles can be amended. Again, looking at the 57 Haverhill Street, you know, I think the other fear in town is somebody builds it and then five years later, somebody tries to convert it into luxury townhouses. 
Um, oh. That's, I, I, again, and I don't even know if that's a legitimate, concern, you know, fear or concern, but I can only imagine the, the, the rumors around town, regard, re really that parcel is, is I think the hardest one, right? Just the, given the size okay. and the location. So yeah. um, just something to think about. I'm just trying to understand when we, if and when the town signs up for this at town meeting, what we're signing up for and, and, and how much we can guarantee at town meeting versus finding out later on during the process that it might be something that town really didn't want. I, I agree completely. And I think that it may, might make sense also for me to look into whether we can have the motion actually say that they are to be conveyed for affordable housing purposes. Um, we, we could have written the motion that way. I and mean, we could have written the warrant article that way, but um, I, I, I will look into whether that's just something we could put in the motion because I have a feeling that's something, you know, that's something I think we would be more, more comfortable with too. Um, if, if, they're, if they're built as affordable, they're, they're going to stay affordable. If for whatever reason they were sold as market rate, which I, I don't see that happening, but I can't say, I couldn't promise you that it could never happen. I, I agree. I, I will definitely look into why, whether we can, you know, word the motion such that it, it limits it to affordable housing. Yeah, since, you know, since you've asked for feedback, I would just struggle yeah. with allowing the town to convey it for free and then finding mm -hmm. out later it was developed for profit. Oh, that we definitely can't do. That <laughs> we're not we're not allowed to do <laughs> legally. We're not allowed to do that. So if we were this to be convey it, so that's why it's right, whatever they'd like. They would if there were to be if it were to be conveyed for market redevelopment, we would have we would we would have to sell it. Like we're not allowed to actually give it for less than what it's worth, and then allow right. someone to develop it. So um, yes, you're right, and I I think I will try to uh, figure out what the right what the right motion is um, to, to be sure that we're, we're very clear that this is for affordable housing development only. All right, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Da Danielle? Yes. This is Chris, this is Chris Hayden. Hello, Chris, go ahead, please. So um, there was a chat that came up from the representative for Habitat for Humanities, which is on, a, on the Zoom call. And he, he or she said that all properties from Habitat for Humanities are deed restricted. That's the way they do it. And being a member of the CPC, that is the only way these properties would get conveyed as far as I'm concerned. And I think the other four members are in agreement with that. That's, I was on the board when we originally um, put these um, parcels in a affordable overlay district. And that's what the uh, that's what the thought and, and the reason for doing that was to make them affordable always. Yes, I agree with that one hundred percent. I I also agree that we want to make sure that the motion is worded so that it's crystal clear um, that that this is for affordable housing development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other? Folks who'd like to make a comment or ask a question. I'm not seeing any hands raised, but feel free to speak up if I'm not seeing you. Maureen? Okay, no. Hi, Maureen. How yes. Are you? Yes. Maureen Dari, North Road Transcript. How are you? Um, oh, thank you. How are you? Good. Are you planning on having any site visits? for any of these places? Yes, we should definitely do that. Um, I think if we are, uh, if, if the town meeting vote is successful and we begin the drafting of an RFP, I, I think site visits would be um, definitely something we would do. Um, I, I think too, um, proposers would be invited to site visits as well. Um, but yes, I, 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 I think that that would be important as part of the community meetings that we would have. Would it, would there be enough time to do site visits prior to town meeting so that people have a better understanding of um, what they're looking at, what they're hearing? I don't see why not. I think that's something that we could arrange um, if, if people are interested in, in, seeing, in seeing the properties. Um, Sure. Um, I will probably need to figure out when that would be and just make that known. Um, I can help you publicize that. 
Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Why don't why don't we be in touch and then we can figure out what can can be published so that um, people can know how and when they they could they could take a look at these properties. Um, Does anyone at the meeting think that that would be a, a helpful thing to do? Just the just in general, the people who are who are in this meeting right now. Would you like to have a site walk with someone from the CPC and Danielle um, to explain what they have in their mind for decision? I think sure. That's a good okay. idea. Um, yeah, we would be happy to do that. Um, okay. Um, absolutely. I think um, just in terms of being easy to communicate with people, if you I'm just trying. I know I have mailing addresses, but I want to. I want a nice, easy way that I can reach out to people. Um, all right. I guess I. I I'll, I'll figure that out. But yes, Maureen, I. I, I would appreciate it if there is a way that we can work together to. To you know. To. To publicize that. Sure. Great. Thank you. Dan Danielle. Okay. Yes. yes. We're gonna have to check with DPW because I think 57 Haverhill is being mm -hmm. used as a. Uh, as a an area to prep for the um, Mount Vernon Street water main. Yes, okay. it is. That, that's okay. what a lot, there was a lot of activity in there and someone asked me the question this past week, if they were already building in there and no, they're not building in there. That's just the location to, uh, to prep and to, to park cars and vehicles and material for the, Haver, uh, for the uh, Mount Vernon Street. So you just got to get clearance from uh, the DPW that there are going to be people walking around in there um, if we do that, and maybe even parking a car or two. Okay. Okay. All right. I will definitely do that. Okay. Um, Danielle, uh, this is Jay from uh, Heritage Way again. Uh, I have one yes. more question. Um, mm -hmm. In your in your previous slide, there was uh, upcoming meetings, a couple of uh, dates, mm -hmm. the September 20 meeting. What's the purpose of that? I, I know this is Warren, Warren article. Yes. So uh, prior to town meeting, um, the select board always holds an informational hearing on all the Warren articles. So uh, that's open to the public. This is going to be held virtually. Um, and uh, the so the, the, that, the Zoom information um, is posted. Um, for the select board um, and they basically go through the whole warrant and people have the public has the opportunity to comment or ask questions or give feedback um, and this is uh, kind of the, the run through of the warrant before town meeting which would happen what? on October 4th. Okay what's a warrant in this case? Oh. Um, so you'll be getting in the mail. Um, it's basically the list of um, proposals uh, for the town meeting um, which will be on October 4th, uh, Monday night in the high school. Um, and that's, um, it's just the warrant will just uh, be, a, it's a paper book that details all of the questions that are, um, that are going to be uh, raised for, for vote. And, um, and these four properties um, are, are the subject of, of, of warrant articles for town meeting. Okay. And how about the October 4th town meeting? Is that a meeting for, for everybody to vote or do we, do we actually get to vote or not? Yep. Case. Yes. So um, at town meeting, yes, as long as you're a registered voter, um, it's an open town meeting. So every registered voter has, um, has a vote. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Danielle? Yes. This is Maureen again. Just for informational purposes for Jay, um, mm -hmm. the town sends that warrant out two weeks prior to the town meeting to every residential address. Um, so they should probably be getting it, well, maybe the end of this week. Um, that Would that be two full weeks before town meeting? Or maybe the end of next week? Um, Maureen, the, I heard the, from the, Mike, uh, the TA, that it should be this Saturday. This Saturday, okay. And it's also, um, posted on the town website so you can view it digitally as well. Um, and that will give you an overview of everything that will be happening at town meeting. Um, yeah, so the, the town website, I'm just gonna put it in the chat really quick. It's on North Reading, ma.gov. Um, 
and you can find uh, the information about uh, you know town meeting and upcoming select board meetings um, on there. Okay, um, I, it's a final question, and so I, I mentioned the um, I mentioned the stream on the back of the house when the rain gets mm -hmm. really huge. It's right up against uh, the house of um, my neighbor on the back, Mike Donahue. I, and, and I don't know if, uh, can someone um, from the town or the builder, the proposer come to take a look? And because I know that Mike uh, built, a, built a huge wall just to prevent his house from sliding and up there because we're, we're right up against the border you know, my, my property and his property. Mm -hmm. um, that's another situation that could be potentially brewing. Okay, when, uh, no, that's a good waters. idea. Yeah, because it's so when it, it, you, you can't see until you, you go there and to, to assess and evaluate because that's, he put a lot of um, uh, crushed stone there and he also planted uh, lots of stuff. That's for water management, and, and that, and that's that's um, that that's a situation other than the the water flooding situation coming to the his house and then my house and the Mike the child's house. Okay, okay, yeah, I think that's definitely something um, we should take a look at. Um, so thank yeah. you, yeah, thank I you. For my, I don't know if Mike is on on, on the line. He he could. He could tell you a little bit more detail on that. Okay. Mike, okay, are you online? You. Yeah, Jay, I'm on. I, I can echo your comments. You know, there there is a brook. Yes, Jay, I'm here, buddy. Well, both of, both mics then. There is a brook that runs between uh, my house, um, 41 Havel Street, and Jay on Heritage. Um, you know, it's a it's a constant constant brook, and when we do get heavy rains. Um, you know, the brook definitely gets enhanced, um, you know, and, and it does work from, it runs north to south. So it's it's originating from, you know, the, the chestnut end and then it runs down towards the high tension wires. So um, it does run through the, the 57 Haverhill uh, parcel. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there's a problem now, but if there is potentially a huge flood because of the mismanagement, that could be an issue actually. So that's, that's my, my concern. Mike, I didn't know that was you there. I was, uh, I didn't know that was you there. <laughs> Thank Danny, you. Is there any, yes. um, is there any uh, pre construction work that the town would do? Um, pre excavations, yes. perk tests, or, or any, anything prior to the RFP going out to determine if, if the land does perk out to either limit the, you know, to try to dial in where where the lot you know the the development would go on 57 Haverhill, or would that all be full disclosure for the developer after the RFP process? I think that level of work will be for the developer, um, and it would probably happen in that sort of due diligence period between choosing a developer and actually closing on on the property and conveying it. Um, I. I think that the town can can make some guesses about where a pro development is most likely to happen, but we probably wouldn't be doing the soil testing for the developer. We probably would, would leave that to their responsibility. If, if the property is determined to be wetlands, to meet mm -hmm. the definition of wetlands, because it's affordable housing, does that mean that the restrictions about building on wetlands don't apply? No, they still apply. They would still need to file with the Conservation Commission if the building would be taking place within the 100 foot um, buffer zone and um, the, the Conservation Commission would treat it in the same way. Because we, we, we abut the general property on Heritage Way mm -hmm. and it's a marsh. <laughs> and I always thought we were safe from overdevelopment because mm -hmm. it's a marsh and so it, it's wonderful to have a buffer zone so that North Reading doesn't turn into just one concrete block after another. And I always figured we we're safe because all of that land is so wet. 
but the concern is that there'll be enough political pressure to allow it to be developed that land will be approved even though it's and nobody could walk that property and question whether it meets the definition of wetlands. All you have to do is buy a brand new pair of shoes and then throw them away afterwards because they've been soaked. And so the idea, my concern mm -hmm. is there'll be enough political that. pressure to say, you know what, we can let it get built on because we need the affordable housing. And so let's, let's bypass the rules. And then everyone who abuts the property, like Jay and the Mikes and everybody else, has unbelievable problems that they're then financially on on the hook to try to solve because their basements are wet. I mean, we definitely aren't looking to have any of the construction take place on the wetlands. Um, the Conservation Commission wouldn't allow for construction on their like within the 12 foot no disturb. Um, there can be construction within the buffer area, like the 100 feet, or I guess it would be the, you know, the 88 feet between the end of the buffer zone and, you know, the, the end of the 100 foot buffer. Um, but those, the wetlands themselves don't, wouldn't be built on. Um, I, I, I wouldn't imagine that the Conservation Commission would ever approve that. And that's certainly not our, our goal in trying to, to do this. Um, I think we know that there is um, an area of 57 Haverhill that's flatter when you first enter the property. Um, it's it, kind of flatter uplands. That part of the, prop, the parcel is probably gonna be the most appropriate for development. We know there are wetlands along the side and, and along the back, they're, they're definitely wetlands and we, would not, we wouldn't expect to see those developed. Um, but I definitely hear your concerns and I, I, you're right. I mean, this, this is why we have a conservation commission and I don't think that, you know, there's anyone who's really pushing to see the wetlands themselves d developed that wouldn't be, um, you know, environmentally responsible. And, 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 you know, I'll, I'll just echo, you know, the, the saturation of the land. And do you know if the conservation commission would, would perform a walk, you know, when's the last time the, the land was classified for wetlands, if that's, if that has expanded or not? Um, do you know if that would be taken into consideration? Yeah, I think usually the way they handle new development is um, if there are wetlands anywhere in the vicinity, they usually ask for them to be flagged, either to show where the, where the resource area is in preparation for a filing or to show that they're outside of it. So, um, I mean, if there is some question, you know, generally the conservation agent will go out and take a look and say, you know, yes, you are definitely close enough to what I know is a wetland, like you have to flag it and you have to do a filing. Um, sometimes she's able to see, you know, right away um, if, if a proposed project is, is far enough that there's no way it's going to be within the buffer. But yeah. That's... Wouldn't it be a good idea that that pre-work is done before we ever get to the decision of people proposing and, and voting on it? Because it could be that when people actually walk the property, they're going to say, this is a, it's not quite a swamp, but it's, it certainly isn't solid ground. It's, it's so wet. I, I would think it would make sense in the interests of time and energy and money mm -hmm. to determine before we go any further, whether this is buildable land, because the, the property that borders our property I mean, I, I have to wear nine inch waterproof boots anytime I go back mm -hmm. there to like trees fall down all the time because their root systems. If you walk the property, like with Mike Dichara's property, you'll see one tree on its side after another because mm -hmm. the, the, the root systems rot out from all the water and the trees just fall over in a heavy wind. Right. So before we have town boats or anything, it seems like it would be logical to survey the property from a wetlands standpoint, because the answer might be on paper, this looked like a great idea. In reality, we can't build on most of this. Well, I mean, I, I have walked the property. I mean, I, I do know there are parts of the property that that aren't wet. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I can't flag the wetland myself, but I can see that there are areas of the property that are, you know, that, that would be feasible for, for development, but um, I, I understand what you're saying. So, um, I mean, for 57 Haverhill, I mean, in particular, because we know there are water issues, um, might we explore um, doing some, you know, town, you know, work to, to confirm the, the conditions on that site? Is that? 
Yeah, Daniel, when I when I had my uh, addition uh, in the garage built uh, five years ago, um, I actually had to go through uh, town approval. Um, I think it's the board of zoning or something. They had they had asked and they had asked if the uh, wetland needs to be seventy five feet or hundred feet away from the construction site. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go through that. I, I missed what you said on the slide. One of the slides says it has to be how many feet away from the wetland or is it, was that on there? If it's within a hundred feet of the wetland, it needs to, um, it, there's a filing with the conservation commission and then they determine where the development can go and how it can proceed and you know under what conditions. Um, and they can say no if it's within that buffer area. If if you know it's too much of an impact to the wetlands, they you know they may not allow it. Um, so that's yeah they yes anything that is within that buffer area or near the wetland they are going to require to be flagged and to to show exactly where where the upland areas are. I mean we would anticipate normally that would be part of the due diligence of a developer. And if a developer got the property and realized that they couldn't develop what they hoped to. Um, you know, that's, I mean, that has happened. Um, we wouldn't foresee a situation where the property looked to be, you know, harder to develop than we thought. And so we just let them build wherever. I mean, we, we, I mean, we're still, we're keeping, you know, the Conservation Commission is still keeping its, its rules. Okay. It, it, it's still the same process. Um, yeah, but I sure. definitely understand your concern. Yeah, sure. I, I, I just, uh, I, I just didn't get anything uh, in the mail. That's why I asked the question now, because eventually, if the flood is if flood, the flood is going to be caused, it's going to come into our property. So that's why um, okay. I'm asking extra questions here. Sure. No, I understand. Thank, thank you for okay. answering. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Danielle, I, this is Jeff again at 112 Chestnut. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask one other question. You made reference to targets for affordable housing for the town and that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, those numbers were deficient. You anticipated they would grow. Mm -hmm. um, other than there being a need, are there incentives for the town to sort of satisfy that target? How is that target set? And is there some incentive for the town to hit that target? In other words, is there a state money that you guys get when you meet that number? Like, why are you do, why, why does this exist at all other than just trying to sort of serve a deed? Does sure. that make sense, that question? Uh, yes, yes. So the, the state's affordable housing law, um, chapter 40B, requires that all towns and cities have 10% of their, of their regular year round housing stock to be um, subsidized and to, to, to meet a certain level of affordability under certain terms. Um, North Reading has, uh, I think at the last census, it was like 5,597 units of housing. And we only have, we have less than 10% of that is, is subsidized and is, and is counted on our, on our inventory. When a town has more than 10% 10 per, 10 or more, they've met the, they've met the, the, the state law. Um, but when they are under that threshold, they don't have the ability to say no to um, developments that come in under chapter 40B if, if it's something that the town doesn't want. Perfect example is, um, you know, the proposal for 20 Elm Street, which um, has been in litigation for some time now. This was a proposal that the town that the ZBA tried to say no to, but is not able to say no to under, or can say no to, but it's, 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 um, you know, we, the town loses its ability to say no to 40B projects, which override the local zoning. So once you hit the 40B threshold of 10%, the town has the ability to look at a project and say, no, that's not one that we want. Um, when, when you're under the the 10%, um, the town is more vulnerable to a project that it might have preferred to say no to because it feels it's not appropriate for one reason or another. Um, so I, I hope that sort of answers your question. It does, um, yeah. It's not so that we, we don't get to control. A, yeah, it's, a, it's about maintaining the local zoning control, exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Jill Gadsby has her hand up. Yes, hi, Danielle. Jill Gadsby, 13 Lee Road. Um, I just wanted to go on record and echo Don's comments that, you know, I think um, the neighborhood would prefer to um, preserve the character. Uh, it's all single family homes right now. I think you've mentioned there was one in-law apartment. Um, so I'm not, I know it's a very small parcel. You're combining the two, um, I think a, a duplex even, or any type of multifamily um, building would be uncharacteristic of the neighborhood. So I just wanted to provide that feedback. Okay, thank you. Thanks.
your other questions. Hi, Danielle. Uh, Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple. One last question. I stepped away for a minute. I'm not sure if this was asked, so I apologize if it was. Does the approval or 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 not of the of these articles does that impact the Elm Street project in any way whatsoever? It does not. Um, the they have an approval, uh, not a not a town approval, but they have a project eligibility approval from the state to go ahead and um, apply for their for their project. Um, that that is based on the percentage of affordability that the town had the day they applied. So anything we develop now doesn't impact 20 Elm Street. In the future, it would eventually, when we get to 10%, it, it will eventually impact future projects that come in. So every little bit helps us to reach that goal. And also I shouldn't say that we're looking to do affordable housing only because we want to hit our 10%. We're looking to do it because we recognize the need for, um, you know, for affordable housing. Okay, so the, so the, basically it's safe to say the message is that we can vote based on the merits of this project and people can't go around saying it impacts the Elm Street project. It would not impact the okay, project. Good. Okay, thank you. You're and you, do, you have, do you have any more hands raised? I am looking for hands raised now. Scrolling through my two pages of participants. I don't see a hand raised. If I'm missing you, feel free to shout out. Okay, I have, I have one more comments tied up to uh, Kyle's comments about the trees. And, and I think in the past couple of years, we had an excessive rains between Mike's house and my house on the, in the forest. We already lost a handful of trees there. And, uh, and that, that, the trees in the forest is the main reason that we bought the property. So, um, and if we lose more trees and the forest is not there, and that, that, that's a big no-no for us. So, I mean, it's just, just want to mention it. Okay, thank you. I will note that the goal is to try to keep as much of the, the natural tree buffer there as possible. Okay. okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I have um, a, a lot of great feedback here. Um, thank you very much, um, you know, for everyone who's given comments. If you think of something that you didn't have a chance to say, um, I'm also going to put my email address in the chat. Um, feel free to reach out um, to the McKnight at North. Of, um, and my phone number is 7835752206. Um, I will be compiling all these comments and passing them along to um, our liaison on the select board. Um, the select board has not yet taken a position on this warrant article, and I think they were waiting for some neighborhood feedback. So they'll, they'll want to hear what we heard tonight. Um, I'll be looking into um, what we can do um, on town meeting floor with regard to those motions to make sure that we're, you know, very clear that we're only conveying for affordable housing. Um, and uh, we're looking into also doing a, a, a day of, 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 or an afternoon or an evening, I guess, of site visits to, for anyone who's interested in seeing these properties. Um, so thank you very much um, to everyone. I really appreciate your taking the time to, um, to let us know your thoughts about, about those, these proposals. Um, thank you, Daniel. Thank, thank you, you, Daniel. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.